You're listening to an Anderson Entertainment production. This episode, we get rather good at opening doors in Fab Facts. We're off on holiday in the randomizer. And David Hirsch talks Terror Hawks. Oh, I love Terror Hawks. That's all coming up in Pod 145. Yeah, don't we know it? Of the Jerry Anderson Podcast. At least it's not Joe Nighting. Let's get started. Let's go. Spectrum is green. The Jerry Anderson Podcast with Jamie Anderson and Richard James. Greetings, one and all. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank you, and all. Richard James. And oh, good, good. And you, yeah, also, Jamie Anderson. Chris Dale, what's he doing over there? Oh, well, he's, he looks like he's putting the finishing touches to the floor waxing. That's good, isn't it? Look at him on his knees there with a cloth in his hand. That's an Not unusual sight indeed. Oh, okay. Well, he's obviously around yours doing the uh, floor waxing more than he is in yeah. mine. Anyway, Chris, it's great to have you here. Uh, you'll be joining us yes. later, obviously, when you finish the for uh, hmm. <laughs> the randomizer, which yes. we're all looking forward I to. Mean, hang on, hang on. Whoa, 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 whoa. Just imagine if you were listening for the very first time. Yes. <laughs> yeah. What on earth is going on, you'd be thinking? Well, I mean, I can tell you this is the Jerry Anderson podcast. In this intro bit, yeah. what we generally do is introduce ourselves, where I say I'm Jamie Anderson, yeah. and you say... I say I'm Richard James, and uh, Chris Dale is waxing lyrical over there in the corner. Nice, nice. Well, because obviously Chris yeah. is busy, but he will be here later yeah. on in the show to give us you yes. uh, give us a random yes. episode of a Jerry Anderson show and talk you through it. Yes, but there yes. are other things yes. that happen, such as... Yes! Well, I thought you'd never ask. There you are, wittering on. We've got fab facts coming up in a little while. Yeah. Uh, that's where Jamie flicks through a book of facts and give me, gives me something fab to consider from the history of Jerry Anderson. We've also got some newsy news, 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 because there's brand new stuff happening right now. There you go. I've said it. That'll be coming up a little bit later on. We've got the second part of uh, Ben's interview with David Hirsch. Oh, yes. The All-American yes. Showdown. That's right, went very well last time. And uh, we've got some uh, emails, of course, from our wonderful Podstrons who've been sending us their messages and posting on our Facebook group and tweeting us and posting on YouTube and all sorts. So we'll be coming to those uh, a bit later on too. I look forward to all those things and all the other things that happen when we do these podcasts, but I think we should probably head straight into Fab Facts. I think we should. Come on, it's like pulling a plaster off, isn't it? Let's get it over and done with. Now, time for this week's Fab Facts. As Richard's already said, Fab Facts is when I've got a book of Fab Facts, I flick mm. through it, Richard shouts Fab, and I read a fact for his mm. consideration and hope that he considers it Fab. Richard, are you ready with your Fab? Born ready. Good, then here comes the flicking. Fab! <sighs> oh, I think you, you, went over, you overshot it a little bit, huh? Well, I'm not going back. That's not oh. how this works. I, I've got the book, I I've got the power. Yeah. Oh, all right. Uh, ooh, gosh, we like a bit of this. Oh. We, you know, I mentioned that show Joe 90 uh, you did in the intro yeah well it gets a little mention here but it's in connection with something which we both enjoy so bear with me while I give you this fab fact go on many of our listeners are you podsterons now uh, I guess yes it's out now isn't it so lots of you may have or enjoy the Doctor Who season 8 Blu-ray collection oh yes John Pertwee Mm-hmm. Yes, I think that's his name, isn't it? I've, I've, yeah, I've, it's just a strange stress on his last barely name. Barely watched any Doctor like, Who, so I wouldn't know. It sounded like something bouncing off a, a window. Between but yeah, so the yeah. John Pertwee season eight uh, Blu-ray. If you've watched it, you may have spotted a Jerry Anderson vehicle in one of the stories. <gasps> oh, good. Have you spotted it, Richard James? No. What are you talking about? Well, in the action-packed thrill ride that is Colony in Space. Is it though? <laughs> well, yeah, well, go on. No, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the model of the IMC spaceship was not built for that story, but actually hails from an Anderson show. Oh. It is, in fact, the bright red F 116 fighter from the Joe 90 episode Talk Down, almost unchanged by the Doctor Who effects team. Wow. So this model was actually part of an assortment of models and props that was sold to the BBC by Century 21. Hmm. But 
Colony in Space also makes use of another pair of Anderson props <gasps> combined to create something altogether more iconic. But can oh. you guess what it is? Uh, it's not Orin's hands, is it? Oh, no, it's much too <laughs> wrong, late. Wrong era, wrong uh, era. No, mm, we're not back to Martin Landau's wig, are we? Uh, no, we're a bit more no, um, no, no. Uh, metallic than that. <laughs> Oh, okay. It's straight this week. No. Uh, <laughs> it's a little something you may know from Doctor Who called the Sonic Screwdriver. Oh, I see. So, the body of the Sonic Screwdriver that John Pertwee very briefly uses in episode five of the story is the very same prop as used by Alan Tracy as he attempts to save the Zero X in the film Thunderbirds Are Go. Ah. With the addition of a little transmitter bit on the top which comes from a communicator used by Captain Blue in the Captain Scott episode, Model Spy. Well, well. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? It is, yeah. Now, although the prop appearance in episode five of Colony in Space is a very much blink and you'll miss it affair, mm. uh, although it also appears in episode three as an IMC handcuff key. I mean, they got good value out of it, didn't they? They did, yeah, you might as well on these things. It gets much yeah. more screen time the following year during the Sea Devils when the Doctor is seen using it as a mind detector. After that, legend has it that the original prop went missing during filming of Carnival Monsters. And if that's true, then the one we see the Doctor using up until he gets destroyed in the visitation is a yeah. rebuilt version that uses the same basic design as the Thunderbirds Argo model. Oh, well. Still, it is rather nice to think that two unwanted props from two Anderson shows could combine to find a new and rather extensive life on a different show altogether, Doctor Who. Yes, that's incredible. I had no idea. I, I just assumed the, the Sonic Screwdriver prop, for example, would, would be custom built for the show. No, nicked. But, they nicked it, yeah, mate. Nicked it, yeah. <laughs> Blimey. Bit of a scandal. Uh, well, I wouldn't go that far, because I, I think actually they uh, they probably yeah, bought, they they bought, bought it. it, but... Um, yeah. Mm. No, do I do I mind that? Do I, I suppose you know? I suppose I would like to think that all the original Anderson props were kind of kept somewhere afterwards and looked after with great reverence. But well, no, you know that's not the case. Chucked. I know it's a shame, isn't it? They either end up in Doctor Who or in landfill. Yeah, and that's pretty much yeah, it. That's right. So yeah, there great. you go. Well, I'm Very al good. always a big fan of anything that connects the world of Anderson and the world of Doctor Who, because yeah. I consider myself one of those things, and you as well, Richard James. Yes, that's true, yes. Isn't that's it right. lovely? Uh, in fact, there's yeah, a great article on the Jerry Anderson website about the things that connect Anderson and Doctor Who, and another one about the things that connect Anderson and Big Finish. So uh, you oh, might want yeah. to read of those if you've enjoyed this fab fact. But yeah. that, for now, is the end of this week's... Sonic Fact! Yes! Yay, there we go! Now, that, Jamie, I think that's one of my favourites so far. How many have we done now? 140-odd? When do we start? 474. <laughs> no, yeah, 130-ish 100, um, 130 fab facts, I yeah, think, by now. Yeah, Gosh, because it went away for a little while, didn't it? Can you imagine that? The Jerry Anderson podcast without fab facts. I'd feel very, <sighs> very strange. Yeah, indeed. If that was uh, the case. Talking of very strange, our wonderful Podstrons have been in touch. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure they'll appreciate that, but go ahead. I'd love to hear what they've got yeah, to say. God, they, they know I'm only joking. Well, they've been emailing us at podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk. For example, Tony Clark said, Hi, guys. Love the podcast as always. I'm writing with regard to Jerry Anderson references in other TV programs. Here we go. He says, This is taking it in a slight curve in that it references something that I put into a model I made for a book, The Illustrated Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Oh, interesting, Tony. He says, my friend, and someone Jamie knows, Kevin Davies, he of the Terrorhawks opening titles, yep, we know him well, we do. designed the visuals for this book, which was published in 1994, both in the UK and in the US. He says, one of the models I built was a tunnel leading down into the planet Magrathea. Being a lifelong fan of the work of Derek Meddings and of the model work being done in the late 1970s and 80s by Industrial Light and Magic, I decided to play my own tribute. Reading that a model of R2-D2 had been placed among the detail of the alien ship in the film Close Encounters of the Third Kind by ILM, I placed a dinky toy Thunderbird 4 in the model machinery on the left of the Magrathea tunnel. I'm not sure it could be seen in the final photo. I can't locate my copy of the book, but I have a print of one of the other photos of the model taken for the book. Uh, he says, I was given the dinky Thunderbird 2 as a present after a visit to the dentist for a tooth extraction as a child when I was about <laughs> six in the latter half of the 1960s. Over the years, one of the engines at the back of Thunderbird 4 had broken off and it had ended up in my kit box awaiting repair. 
And reading that Derek Meddings and his team would use kit parts to add detail, I also used some girder-like kit pieces from a Space 1999 Hawk kit. That's not oh, all he lovely. says. Yeah, in homage to the lemon squeezer in... Oh, so, help yourself, Jamie. Just having a yeah. drink. It's not a beer, Carry I promise. On. Carry on, sorry. Yeah. Uh, he says, uh, in homage to the lemon squeezer in Thunderbird 1's launch bay, I added one end of one of those plastic balls that would be filled with washing powder and placed in the washing machine, which was starting to appear in the 1990s. This particular design, a powder distributor, had the open end resemble fan blades, so it became an extractor fan on the right-hand side of the tunnel. So those were my nods to the work of Jerry Anderson and Derek Meddings. Brilliant. Keep up the good work with the podcast, and that's Tony Clark, isn't that great? Cheers, Tony. That is great. Yeah, I love love it when little things like that make their way into various sets and models all over the place. I mean, uh, we, yeah. we chucked a couple of uh, Thunderbird One and Thunderbird Two toys into a the corridor set for the Firestorm um, ah, for mini yes. So, uh, indeed, yes, right. it's a lovely thing to do. Linton Keneally got in touch and said, "Hi there, Jamie and Richard. Firstly, I would like to say that your I would like to say that your <laughs> podcast is one of my favourite podcasts. But <laughs> yeah, now he says I listen to them as often as I can, as I have some time in my day. When I do, I just love to listen to every second of each pod. Ooh. Now, on to second part of why I'm writing this email, I would like to give you a fab fact. Ooh. My fab fact is that in the 2018 film Aquaman, that there is a Jerry Anderson nod. Ah, oh, yes, I think we might know this. Yes. He says in one scene early in the movie where Queen at Lana, I think, gets saved after being thrown into shore by a massive wave. She's discovered by the lighthouse keeper who finds her unconscious. From there, he takes her inside the lighthouse and places her on the couch in the living room to recover. And during the time she recovers, she watches the telly and that's where she sees the TV series Stingray. Yes. Yes. I hope you enjoy my fab fact. Keep up the good work, says Linton. We have covered that before, haven't we? But that's always nice to hear. I believe we have done, but it's always nice to look at these little nods yeah. that make it into pop culture, so that's great. Uh, a couple more. Julian Bagg says, hopefully this one is good enough for Fab Facts. I mean, really, they're all on our case this week, aren't they? In Sonic X, the Sonic the Hedgehog anime from the early to mid-2000s, says Julian, there was a pretty shameless Thunderbirds homage. In the eighth episode of the first season, Satellite Swindle, Dr. Eggman deploys a satellite-stealing flying robot known as the E-90 Super Sweeper, which the heroes struggle to fight in the upper atmosphere. This robot is clearly based on Thunderbird 2, with green and red coloration and a jettisoning pod. The only major difference is that it has the head of a bird. Furthermore, in the same episode, Taylor flies a new jet called the X-Tornado to fight the E-90 and when the X-Tornado is launched from the ground of a, grounds of a mansion the runway is lined with guess what? Palm trees? You're right which fold back yeah, during yeah. launch. Love it. Anyway, some more uh, blatant Anderson references that you'll usually see. The show creators were clearly Thunderbirds fans. There may be more homages in Sonic X and the wider Sonic Opus but those are the only ones that immediately spring to mind. Thanks for those, Julian. They're great spots. Yeah. Lovely. And uh, Finally, for now, Jim Gall. I tried to find the still picture from back in the day of Fireball's crew assembled in the Fireball Junior looking through the canopy. There's almost a replica of the same scene from the Millennium Falcon with their crew in Star Wars. We have our heroes at the helm, the heroines beside them, some pets, a Wookiee and a Lazoon. The friendly robots, Robert and C-3PO and R2-D2, will have to share Matt Mattick's glory in this one. But the second I saw it, I was back in Fireball. If anyone can find it, must be you guys. That's a Fireball XO5 reference there. Spotted in Star Wars, I think. Yeah. Very good. Chris Thanks, Dale Jim. on the case there, I'm sure, once he's finished the floor. Yeah, keep those references coming. We know that uh, lots of Jerry Anderson questions keep appearing on various uh, daytime quiz shows and so on. But if you've spotted any uh, Jerry Anderson homages in any other show, do let us know. Podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk. I look forward to receiving all those emails and passing them yeah. on to you, Richard James. <laughs> Thanks. You do a great job of sifting and reading, so uh, <laughs> give me a little sifting. break to think about the uh, Jerry Anderson news, which is coming up any second oh, now. Is that actually, coming up any second now? Yeah, yeah. I've actually forgotten to oh. put the news in, you see, into the script, so oh, while you've been doing yes. that, I've not only opened my um, cherry and pomegranate yes. fizzy water. So we heard. But uh, I've also written the news, so should we have the Jerry Anderson oh. news? Go on, then let's hear what the news is. Uh, Richard mm. James Yes You like to introduce this segment, don't you, by saying Newsy news, news, news No, that's not what I was thinking, actually, but okay, that'll do Oh Yeah, that's fine No, don't worry What don't were worry you thinking? No, 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 forget right. it, it's fine oh, you, you I feel like that. I boobed Yeah oh. <laughs> <laughs> I often think that when I look at you Now, Richard James, you're a big mm. fan of uh, of rock music and metal, aren't you? 
Oh yeah, yeah. You just you just hold me back. But then you're probably a subscriber to uh, Rock and Metal magazine. Yeah, I've got all my copies stacked over there in the garage. Actually, well, then you will have noticed that in issue ninety four we get a little shout issue out in the editorial. Yeah. Oh, yes, I noticed that, yeah, yeah. But you have to remind me. And there's a little uh, (laughs) advert for the Jerry Anderson store in there as well. Is there? Yes. Come on, Flicks, we'll find it. Yeah, I've just... uh, Wait. Page what? uh, Yes. It's issue 94. 94. It's right in the middle there somewhere, the the advert, I I got it. There it is. Oh, that's nice. Nice picture of you, Jamie. That's, oh no, sorry. That's, that's the uh, that's one of the death metal groups. No, that the, and that's oh, Barbara Bain. Maybe you're looking at possibly. Oh yeah, yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Anyway, um, so. thank you very much to Rock and Metal Magazine for the little shout out and the uh, little feature in there. We really appreciate it. If you are a rock and metal fan, do let us know. Podcast JerryAnson.co.uk. Mm. Getting back onto topic slightly, I've got a nice Good. surprise for you if you've pre-ordered a Thunderbirds model kit. Oh, yeah, they look great. Yeah, well, they were supposed to be shipping out at the end of the month. Well, they are shipping now. In fact, if you were one of the first to pre-order, you may already have yours in your hands. They have been extremely popular and continue to be, but you should now start to see pictures of them and people assembling them on social media. If you are building a kit, do take progress photos and email them to us, podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk, because we would love to share them on the podcast Mm. Facebook group and elsewhere around the Anderverse. There's uh, Thunderbird 2, a clear version of Thunderbird 2, so you can see the insides. It's kind of cool. Lovely. Thunderbird 2 Launch yeah. Bay, Thunderbird 4, Thunderbird 5 with Thunderbird 3, Thunderbird 1, uh, Fire Flash, Fab 1, and the Mole. That's probably it. There's 11 kits in all. They look rather smashing. I am hoping at some point later this year I'll get a chance to build one myself, but not quite mm. yet. One of the reasons that is is because it's rather busy in the run-up to Jerry Anderson <gasps> Day on the 14th yes. of April, coming very, very soon across the globe. And uh, there's some rather nice Jerry Anson Day merch out. If you want to get a T-shirt to celebrate Jerry Anson Day and have that ready for the big day, just pop along to the store and search, uh, well, Jerry Anson Day. Coming over the next few weeks, we will have some announcements about some rather lovely partners we're doing some activity with on Jerry Anson Day itself. Ooh. I can't say too much. It's possible that by now some of the news has broken. Right. If not, okay. then I suggest you keep an eye on the network distributing facebook page or oh. twitter account at network tweets mm-hmm. um see what they have to say about jerry anderson day i'm rather excited about it mm. the thunderbird 6 and thunderbirds are go logo t-shirts are shipping now so if you've ordered one of those it should be on its way to you and finally for this new section the doppelganger dvd and blu-ray sets uh, are now in stock and shipping They've got the rather lovely reversible cover with the very, very fancy uh, sort of retro late 60s style poster cover artwork on one side of that reversible cover. It does look rather fantastic. And um, the HD version, the Blu-ray version of Doppelganger looks absolutely stunning and pristine and gorgeous and lovely. So um, well worth a watch. I think for now, that though is the end of this week's Jerry Anderson News. That was the news. That was the news. You're in particularly oh, fine good. voice today. Well, thank you. I try my best, as you know. Now, over on Facebook, uh, specifically facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash podstrons. Great place. Our listeners have been sharing their model building tips. They've been spotting Jerry Anderson references in other shows and sharing memes, usually involving me and Jamie and usually from Simon Allen. But uh, Paul Hyder <laughs> says, uh, now, this is you're like this. Anybody know the Anderson connection to the Archbishop of Canterbury, 1559 to 1575? Hmm? Uh, yeah, what? Yeah, well, he was the origin of the name Nosy Parker, says Paul. I oh. mean, that's that, uh, th- there. That's why people are joining the podcast that, group, because it's you know, that, full of amazing facts. Like that. That's great. <laughs> yeah. uh, Zach Reynolds says, It may not be an Anderson show, but it's got cool puppets and practical effects. Any love out there for Starfleet? Not mm-hmm. one I know. No. Yeah. yeah, well, I mean, it had Denise Breyer in it as Commander Makara, yeah. um, but I've, okay. I've only seen bits of it. It's... Mm. It's a very kind of um, limited uh, knockoff. <clears throat> I mean, um, a homage oh, to all steady. things Anderson, isn't it? Uh, well, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I'm, I wasn't so keen on it, but I know that lots of people that are very keen on it. And obviously yeah. anything with Denise in gets my vote. Yes. Uh, Ian Burgess says, Listening to the extra track on Space 1999 Volume 1, and Nick Briggs lets it slip that we're getting a Volume 2. Oh. Let's see. What Uh-oh. a naughty slip. 
Oh dear. Well, you better get on to that, Jamie. Well, do you know what? I, You've got something. I, well, I was to say, I know that's the case because I've just read the storyline for the third episode of Volume <laughs> Two. So <laughs> great, great, nice. There you Which go. is great, uh, by the way. Oh, I bet it is. Uh, Jonathan says, I finally got the Space Patrol DVD box set. I already have it in Blu-ray, but there's no bonus on it. On this set, there's the first episode of Twizzle. Now I only miss Lavender Castle to complete my Jerry Anderson collection. Very good, Jonathan. Nice um, work. Yeah, absolutely. So do let us know. What's missing from your collection? Have you just got the one more thing to get? Space Precinct, perhaps? DVD box set? Or... Uh, Lavender Cast. What what is it that's missing from your Jerry Anderson collection? Let us know. And finally on our Facebook page, Tom Hodden says, Happy 26th anniversary to Richard James and all at Precinct 88. Aww. Aww. Yeah, 26 years since Space Precinct premiered back in 1995. That is bonkers. <gasps> Makes me nice. feel very old. Yeah, crazy. So there you go. Do join in the fun on our Facebook group. There are a couple of questions to answer and we'll let you in and uh, you can post whatever you like within reason. <laughs> Well, you can post whatever you like, but if it's, with, if yeah. it's without reason, it might get removed. It, yes, it won't last very long, exactly. And then you might as well. There, yeah, quite. There you go. Richard James. Done. Yes. You're done with that bit? Yeah. How do you fancy a little trip across the Atlantic? What, now? Yes. But sure don't, thing. Don't worry, we don't actually have to take it because uh, it's two transatlantic chums of ours, Ben oh, Page yeah. and David Hirsch. And Great. They are going to continue chatting. Okay. So, good. if you don't mind, shall we make way for the Americans? Yeah. All right. Let me just uh, squeeze over here. There you go. Thank you. And uh, make sure you wipe your feet, chaps, because we know what you like. Uh, yeah. Chris has just waxed the floor. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. Oh, Ben's uh, yeah. track mud in everywhere. Typical. Uh, but a disaster. <laughs> Uh, anyway, David Hirsch was much more considerate. So here is part two of the chat with David Hirsch. So we went from working at Starlog to meeting Jerry Anderson yeah, to working yeah. on Five Star Five and the compilation films, almost working on Terra Hawks. Yeah, I but- went out to I was I was with him at Fanderson 82 and they were just starting uh, pre-production on Terra Hawks at Bray. And he invited me to come out to the studio. And I got a little tour of what facilities they had at the time. I met Steve Begg. Steve actually remembers my being there more than I do, <laughs> which is, I guess, a testament to the fact that he's younger and brighter. But uh, what happened was, after spending you know about an hour there and touring the facilities, Jerry got called away and was unable we were unable to finish and then i had to, i found out after i got back to the states that he he just couldn't work in it me into the schedule mm-hmm. do you know what you would have been doing if you had uh was there a plan or was it just kind of loose i kind of it was kind of loose i kind of assumed i would i'd be doing a lot of the same stuff i was doing on five star five which was some behind the scenes stuff maybe some uh helping on the scripts because on five star five my my title that he came up with was Anglo American Coordinator, and it was to sort of make sure make sure the movie was acceptable to American audiences. Oh dear, <laughs> um, you know, because you know, one, one of my big comments about reading the script was I thought we didn't have enough character development. I wanted to know hmm. more about our hero and the reasons why he was a former military man and now he's sort of like a a, a, a a spaceship pilot for hire and I said we have to get a little bit into that so I wrote a little kind of like early script bits to just sort of flesh that out as suggestions for them to do so I kind of thought I might be doing that but uh, I think because Jerry was getting a lot of backing uh, domestically f- from the UK and a lot of interest from Japan, I think mm. he wasn't as interested in the American market. Uh, he was just glad to get the show off the ground. Yeah. And he just really just didn't know how to tell me that at that point, after several years of, you know, promising me uh, a part in things that he just couldn't bring me into it. Mm. So it wasn't until, uh, you know, Jamie reached out and uh, said, look, you know, I want to make this up to you. And we talked about a few things. And then Stephen and Andrew came for a visit and wanted me to give them a tour of the old world's fair site in Flushing Meadow, which I live right near. Oh, okay. So I have, you know, very uh, strong memories of the world's fair as a kid. 
So I went there, I brought them, I had the guidebooks and stuff, and I showed them where a lot of pavilions were because Stephen, of course, had Barry Gray's uh, movie of um, their trip to the World's Fair of Jerry and Sylvia and right. Barry Gray going there, which he included on the uh, This is Super Marination set. So while we were talking, you know, I was ta- telling them how much I really enjoyed their scripts for the first series. It came out that, uh, you know, they were interested in me contributing to the second series. So they talked it over with uh, Jamie. I pitched some ideas. And the one story that they really liked was this story that was kind of, uh, we got a (laughs) ambulance outside. Let's wait for that. We'll Uh, hold on for a second. Oh, they're coming to take me away. So did you, you weren't involved then in uh, Space Police or anything subsequent? No, no. Jerry and I kind of... Uh, it was a bit of a parting of the ways. I had a parting of the ways, primarily because he I was just busy doing my thing. I kind of switched my interest to... Um, I spent a couple of years writing about film music. Hmm. And um, I had a column on film music in Starlog for a couple of years and interviewed a lot of composers for them in another magazine called Soundtrack. I was very friendly with uh, Dennis McCarthy, Jay Chataway, and Ron Jones, who scored Star Trek The Mm -hmm. Next Generation and the subsequent shows. So I spent a lot of time going out to L.A., meeting with Mike Okuda, who was the scenic artist, and uh, wrote about that stuff. I interviewed Mike's wife and Doug Drexler for Star Star Trek magazine. So I kind of switched gears. And my yeah. interest changed a little bit. I worked on the restoration of the Enterprise in 92 for the Smithsonian. Mm-hmm. So there was a little bit of a shift there. But in recent years, it came back to the Anderson stuff with Jamie and Andrew and Steve. Stephen. And um, uh-huh. so one of the ideas that I had pitched for Tara Hawks was I kind of want to do this homage to the show itself. And it came out of a story that I had played with years ago when I was at Starlog and we talked, we were talking about how movie sequels were always at a lower budget than the previous film. You know, they put, you know, $10 million into the first film, but the second film they put in 5 million because, well, you know, it's going to have a limited audience. Uh Diminishing returns. Right. Diminishing returns. So I thought, what if, what if the first movie was actually produced by aliens who were trying to raise money to get back to their home planet and they're pissed off that the sequel is being done on a lower budget. <laughs> so a great idea. Kinda, right. So it kind of came out of that story and I started putting in the things about, you know, uh, my visit to Bray and what the studio was like and everything. And I wrote this uh, idea out and Jamie sent me notes and he said, okay, let's work with this, but I want you to change a few things. Um, I had a character that was blatantly Jerry Anderson in the show and he was this nice guy and everything. And Jamie wanted a more flamboyant character. So he became the, you know, Lord low grade. Yeah. And a weird thing happened as I'm writing the story, the character who was my least favorite in the original show, Stu Dapples suddenly became the major character. Yeah. I was going to ask you if you got one over to tear Hawks before you, got asked to do the audios or if you still not not, i got one over it for the audio series because Uh the audio series really was terrific the first series just blew me away and i said this is what the show should have been Hmm. we had some really serious episodes of some nice twisted humor Mm -hmm. so left of center as you said right so as i started putting the story together in my head it suddenly became so natural that Stu should be the producer. (laughs) And I'm writing this thing and going, damn, he's so easy to write for, Uh you know, the whole, the whole bits with him. It's funny how a character will reach out and grab you like that. Right. (laughs) And Einstein, who everyone admits was such a total uh, wet blanket in the series, Mm -hmm. very unlikable for whatever reason we suddenly f- said we could have fun with him. And I said, what if he turns out to be basically a fanboy hmm. of the puppet shows? And <laughs> he, he's going to go like absolutely gaga that, you know, he's the only person who doesn't see a threat to somebody spilling the beans that there's a terror Hawk organization in a movie. Right. 
<laughs> you know, it's like it's like the UFO episode where they get receive a script that tells the whole story of Shadow. I said, well, what if that has the same connotation to everybody but Einstein? Right. Yeah. So it became a bit of a you know a, a sort of self spoof of the show being done by puppets. Uh huh. But just trying to really just make the characters nice. So you had, you know, its star as now the writer, the alien producer, who's trying to get this thing made for his own reasons. And it gets taken over by these detestable humans who (laughs) make a mockery out of him because he has to make his uh, nephew, uh, his uncle, the front. Right. Who's a complete idiot anyway. (laughs) And it just... It just kind of, it, you know, when they say that sometimes things write themselves, this did write itself. And I'm just getting from the beginning to the end. And I had never written a script like this. I'd never written anything. I never thought I could write comedy. And yet it worked out. It was just, uh, you know, it was just a lot of fun. I was, I was in stitches when <laughs> Jamie sent me the rough edit. Uh, I was like, this is great. I think I had one, I think I only had one or two notes to send back because I just was making suggestions that it would be nice we do this and this. Yeah. And he said, "Oh yeah, we're doing that." I, um, I think the only thing in hindsight that I said I really wish I had suggested was when um, young uh, it star is saying, well, "I'm going to sit back and eat popcorn." That I wanted. I, I said I should have had the bell of the microwave go off in the background <laughs> at the end of the <laughs> end of the scene because I said that just would have sold the gag. <laughs> Um, but it worked out. Uh, I think, I, I, th- I think I was worried that Steve Begg might be insulted by my characterization. Of right. <laughs> There's a, a bit of a Steve Begg pastiche there. Yeah. Yeah. And the weird thing was, um, the first time I'm listening to the performance, I'm going, you know, it doesn't sound like Steve. It sounds like Bill Pierce. <laughs> You're right, actually. That's true. It's like he sounds much with that uh, that Bill's wonderful Scottish brogue and everything. I look like that's Bill. Was that intentional? And nobody will admit to that. Even Steve yeah. won't admit to anything like that. <laughs> How did it feel to hear the original voice cast coming in to do uh, stuff that you wrote? It uh, that was that was wonderful. I mean, the the cast uh, is terrific, and and Beth did a superb job picking up the slack uh, on the characters because she was new. Beth Chalmers taking over for yeah. Ann Riddler. Yeah. I mean, that was, you know, you had to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the biggest thing they had to get used to with, with the cast was the fact that, uh, you know, even Denise admits to it, Denise Breyer, that she sounds more like Zelda now in real life than she does Mary. <laughs> so Zelda was perfect. Mary just sounds a lot older mm-hmm. than she should. And everyone sounds like they haven't been changed a day. So you had to, once you got used to that, and as, as we got into series two and then series three, it, it became natural to hear them that way. Yeah. You know? So coming back for series three, you wrote two more scripts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, that was a real learning curve because, you know, uh, anyone familiar with, with the, the audio knows that Jamie left series two on a real cliffhanger and he would not tell me how he resolved the cliffhanger. <laughs> and I'm like, but how do I write this in? He goes, well, just assume we've resolved it. <laughs> okay. All right. So I pitch him some story ideas. Uh-huh. He likes two of them. And now, as I'm writing them, he's dropping me little notes as to where we're going. And it's like, now you're sa- he's saying, well, we have the clones. We're not, Einstein, the original Einstein is not there. We have the clones now. So it's kind of like we're auditioning the clones throughout mm. series three. And that was kind of scary and wonderful at the same time, because he's, he's throwing me the, the bone to create new characters. Right. So I go back and I listen to what, you know, Steve and Andrew did with their show where they had the different clones and Jamie wanted the one in my first story set sail from misadventure to be unsuitable. So he had to be a bit of a bigger idiot than or a bigger nasty than Einstein was at times. I had to like yeah. find what, didn't make Einstein work and then magnify it. Right. <laughs> so 
I came up with a character that was sort of more f- full of himself, has more confidence than he deserves. He thinks he's read everything. He knows everything, mm-hmm. but he knows nothing. And, you know, they always say, write what you know. So uh, when we meet him, he's an optician. <laughs> working in a budget optical store, which at the time I was. So he's like, he's at the bottom of the barrel and they go on a cruise, which I had done recently. So I knew Uh about cruise ships. I think actually, I think the stateroom number was the same stateroom number we were really in. (laughs) And we did complain on one cruise that we didn't like the the view. So a lot of that was in there. A lot of of it translated into art imitating life. Oh yeah, of course. And and the the all-you-can-eat bacon. Yeah, that was a big thing. You know, it's an important uh, plot point. That was very important, and I had to explain to them: this is American bacon. This yeah. is not British bacon. It's a difference. You have uh-huh. to understand: it's crispy, it's thin. <laughs> this is why people like to pile their plate with it. <laughs> so there was a lot of that because I remember during the when they were, well, I was listening to the recording sessions, which mm-hmm. sadly a lot of them came up at the last minute, so I was never able to get to England. Oh. We, we should also mention that in the second series, one of the things we were faced with was Jamie didn't know if Denise was going to be available because mm-hmm. she had a long bout of laryngitis. So I had to sort of write Zelda and Mary out of the script initially. And then as she became available, we started to slip them in to the show. Mm-hmm. And it was more Mary because there was a story arc then that had taken Zelda out of the picture. Right. So we had also it stars need to do this as a way to prove to his grandmother that, you know, we're worthy. Come back to us. So we did that. So when we did series three, of course, now we had we knew we had Denise full time. So we did that story. And Mm -hmm. one of the things that came out where Jamie and I were thinking along the same lines was the creation of the new Terrahawk craft, the boat, the Seahawk, the Seahawk, which I had kind of like come up in my mind coming up with something called the Seahawk because uh-huh. it just seemed natural. And then yeah, Jamie's just like out a perfect of the fit. Right. And out of the blue, Jamie sends me this drawing. He goes, can you work this into the story? I'm like going, uh, yeah, I think I already did. <laughs> then I had to figure out what it did, you know, right. yeah. and try and describe it in audio terms. I mean, the one thing you learn when you're writing for Big Finish is that you have to write it like a live action script, like you're seeing the visual, uh-huh. because they're going to put in sound effects, they're going to put in music. It's not like somebody just reading an audiobook. Right. But you still have to do things like a scene has to start with Einstein and Mary saying, Oh, we've pulled up to the studio. You have to establish that because you can't kind of do that in audio terms. There's not so, a visual way to establish it right. being audio. Right. So here I'm creating this new craft in visual terms and I'm trying to visualize it. And then what sound effects are they going to use? What's the arrangement of the bridge? Where do people sit? <laughs> you know, you're, you're thinking of all these things and it, it, it's very difficult, but again, it, it, the story became uh, very obvious. I had to bring back our pirate captain Captain from series Goat. three. Yeah, Captain Goat, which was great. And of course, I, I had to go and look up the script to make sure that I was using all his same, you know. <laughs> his pirate lingo. Pirate lingo. Exactly. I wanted it exactly the way. I, uh-huh. I, I didn't want to make something up that wouldn't sound like Captain Goat. Right. And um, it, it just to add the whole thing about, you know, them being, the robots being seasick and everything. <laughs> So there was there was a lot of fun in doing that. And a cameo from David Graham, I think, right? Oh, uh, well, the David Graham thing came about where Jamie just asked me out of the blue, who would you like to do the voice of this professor character? And mm-hmm. he was, his name was sort of like a, a variation of Professor Matthew Maddock from Fireball mm-hmm. that David had done. So I'm like, I'm racking my brain. I'm thinking, you know, who is the last person who would do this? And I said, <laughs> oh, I'd love David Graham to do it. And the next thing I know, he's doing it, which was, <laughs> wow. <laughs> you yeah. know, Because that goes right back to the beginning for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For all of us, so, I guess. <laughs> oh, God, yeah, because David was in all the early shows. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he's a, he's a wonderful voice actor, and it was wonderful to see him still do Parker for the Thunderbirds ago CGI mm-hmm. show. 
But if you go back to, I mean, and the funny thing is when I wrote the follow-up episode, which I initially didn't know it was going to be right after uh, the UFO episode, I originally put his character in briefly in the, um, the banquet scene at the end. And he was still supposed to be walking around with a plate of bacon, <laughs> but uh, the scheduling for the uh, recording of that episode didn't have him in the studio. So mm -hmm. Jamie had me write him out, but I had no idea when I was doing that episode that um, I was creating the final character for uh, who was going to become the final Einstein. So that was, I um, probably would have been scarier had I known that uh, yeah. when I started. But they, that was, that was kind of a weird episode because I don't know where the whole thing about the, uh, the trailer park came from. It just <laughs> kind of worked into it. Uh, yeah. I just thought, you know, what would be nice if he was just some ordinary guy. He seemed like some ordinary guy who was doing just some ordinary job or he helped people out uh -huh. and the whole Roswell thing. I think uncharacteristically I think the, a, a people very person. uncharacteristic, but I'm hit, dropping hints at the end of the episode that he actually knows more mm. than uh, he lets on to me. And um, it was just a lark that I created uh, Stu Dapple's American cousin Candy Dapples. Because I, just, I love the name Candy Dapples. <laughs> and then to have Beth do such a brilliant variation. Uh, it's such good fun. Of the voice. Yeah. You know, I, I just try and imagine them all in the studio and, <laughs> you know, Robbie laughing his ass off as she's mimicking him. You know, it was just great. I feel sorry, though, that I came up with these weird names that they had such trouble recording. I mean, poor Denise just kept tripping over uh his made up a name um <laughs> and i was like i'm sorry <laughs> you know <laughs> i'm just i'm just i'm just reaching out trying to come mm -hmm. up with crazy names to use it's like when you uh you write a scene with the crazy snowstorm and yeah. the production manager sees the script and goes ah crazy snowstorm how are we gonna how do that we, yeah how are we gonna afford that you know <laughs> Yeah, you know, send some guy out for soap flakes and keep throwing it and sweeping them up. Luckily, you don't have to do that in audio. You know, so it was just um, my trying to explain to them what kind of sounds really, if, if they weren't familiar with, because here I'm trying to write American locations. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to give them kind of places that they normally would not have thought of. Right. You know, so I'm, I'm going to, you know, Arizona, Nevada, whatever. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I, I wanted to do things just a little differently from what um, everybody else was doing. You know? Yeah. Well, what a great adventure bringing Terrahawks back in audio form. It was. Yeah. I highly recommend that uh, if our listeners haven't checked those out, that they go and do so. I was a little disappointed that uh, we didn't do a, another series or at least a spinoff series because I, I, yeah. I know we didn't didn't continue because I think Jamie was concerned about Denise's availability to do it. Sure. So I kind of I, I, I kind of pitched some ideas to him about some spinoffs with other characters, including <laughs> Stu. Um, but I guess you know he had, he has a plateful to begin with. Sure. He's um, you know doing some marvelous directing with the Doctor Who's and story mm -hmm. editing, and now they're doing Space Nineteen Ninety Nine on audio, which is uh, a wonderful reimagining of the show. Mm -hmm. I recommend that too. Um, the next box set should be out. Uh, next month yes i believe you're right yeah yeah david what's next for you what's uh on your plate do you have a project you're working on that you can tell us about or is it all very uh, hush hush it it is kind of hush hush i'm working on a, a book right now with um okay. a fellow author well actually it's going to be two books okay but i'm also doing uh i'm finally realizing a, t a 20 year dream of uh producing uh, some CDs of some friends of mine who do a cappella uh, musical recreations in Japan, and they do some wonderful stuff. It's it's unusual and it's yeah. different. And every year, I mean, they go around, they perform, and they do their own CDs that they sell. But I'm trying to get, I've been trying to get it sold here and um, distributed on iTunes and stuff. And I have a friend who's got a record company that I've done. I've done quite a few soundtrack albums i actually i the one 
Jerry Anderson one. I did I did Thunderbird six for uh, MGM when they first released. Um, oh yeah, the movies on um, DVD during the uh, the on the feature film and two th- the live action feature film. Yeah, I have those DVDs on the shelf behind me. Yeah, yeah. So um, we got to do Thunderbird six because I had. Um, Barry's mono mixes of the score at the time. I didn't know there were multi tracks, so uh, it's nice that later on that uh, Ralph and everyone did the multi track remixes of Thunderbirds Are Going Thunderbird Six for La La Land, mm-hmm. and uh, that they're the stuff they've been doing for Fanderson has been phenomenal. The Silva Screen range that they're doing now is really good as well. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 you know available to people. Of course, mm-hmm. we don't have Fanderson memberships, and a lot of the Fanderson stuff is now out of print. Mm-hmm. But it's great that Barry's music lives on. You know, I tried for a long time to get uh, some albums done when Starlog was doing records, and uh, at the time there was no interest. So the fact that everything's come around and yeah, quite you know, right it, too. It, it, it's it's kind of sad that none of this happened. I mean, Jamie thankfully has been doing really well with Jerry's products. I wish Jerry was around to uh, see this, but uh, uh, Jamie himself has said that he sometimes is afraid his dad might say, what are you doing to this stuff? You know, <laughs> why, why, why are you doing this to my work? You know, but uh, that's true of any of us. When we write something and you hand it over to other people, uh, yeah. you hope that they're going to raise it to another level. Yeah. And it might not always be in the way that I guess we might expect. Right. When we pass it on right. to the yeah. pass on the torch. Yeah. yeah. I don't I don't know what he would think of Space 1999 of the audio series, but I think he would be very proud of what Jamie did with Terrahawks because um it definitely it's it's I think he I think Jamie made it a better show and it makes mm-hmm. you appreciate the original series much better. Hmm. And uh, you know, now we got you know the sh- the new shows people can see New Captain Scarlet in the form it was intended. Mm-hmm. Space Precinct keeps uh, coming out. I mean, that was a show that really deserved better than it got because yeah. it, it 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 had so much potential. Mm-hmm. Yeah, great series and Firestorm coming soon too. Yeah, yeah, Firestorm is. Uh, I mean, that, that first one was really beautiful, and then just the the new puppetry of the little demo they did recently the puppetry is so lifelike it's amazing so hopefully he can get that uh i mean some, some great stuff so yeah, uh, great know, stuff we, happening we have a lot of good things coming along the pike we certainly do david yeah. uh one final question for you before i let you plug your social media or whatever you want to plug <laughs> uh is there kind of a, a central element or a something an essence that makes a Jerry Anderson show. What is that? What is it? What is it that makes a Jerry Anderson show? Do you think? I think, you know, the one thing that especially that came through in the, in the earlier shows was there's always a sense of hopefulness of uh, fair play and honesty. I mean, you know, like I said, there was, there was a clear delineation between good and evil. You watch a lot of stuff now and there's such gray areas that I think for small children, it's harder to grasp what's going on. Hmm. You know, when as an adult, you have to look back and go, well, the villain had this motivation and had that motivation. The Jerry Anderson shows, you have anywhere from half an hour to an hour of just absolute entertainment. Yeah. So it's uh, not just the characters, it's the visual style of the show because they hmm. always try to go beyond what they are. You know, even with Terra Hawk's lower budget than what he had for shows, I mean, not dollar wise, of course, it's just what things cost more than mm-hmm. it always tried to reach beyond and do better. Yeah. Always pushing the bar. Right. So, uh, you know, the next episode wasn't necessarily going to be, you know, uh, oh, we're just going to do it on the cheap. We're going to try and get better. We're going to learn from mistakes or whatever. And, really wow the audience so that's what jerry always wanted to do I, I i i always remember when they did the um the souvenir program for thunderbirds ago the first pa- page when you open the cover is explosion mm. but that's what the show is like 
action, big explosions, bangs. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. And I think, you know, a lot of the early shows, that was his signature trademark. Things got blown up. Yeah. Uh, it was all part of just entertainment. You know, uh, when you look into any of Jerry's shows and the story Bibles for the shows, Jerry, first and foremost, wanted something that would be entertained. So, you know, he would skirt sometimes a little bit of logic. I mean, you know, we go back to Space 99, people always complain, oh, the moon can't actually do this. But this was born out of necessity because it was the only way he could sell the show to uh, Abe Mandel, mm -hmm. who didn't want the show to take place on Earth. So he had to come up with this elaborate outlandish concept for Abe Mandel to say, okay, I'm going to put the money in. Now, he's got to make it look good. So style becomes important. Yeah, It was Jerry's idea for the Eagle cockpit to have the seats below deck level, which even though it didn't make sense to the design, it looks great on camera. Mm -hmm. Jerry had an eye, had always had an eye for the visual. Yeah. That's what, what was strong. It looked pleasing. It looked entertaining. It wowed you. Yeah. And all of his shows right through, right through Lavender Castle all had this eye candy. Mm. You know, that's why the toys sell so well. Yeah. <laughs> because you look at whether it's the uh whether it's Fireball XL5, the UFO Interceptor, the Hawkwing, you look at it and it's a pleasing shape. I mean, uh, the fact that people just love the Eagle, that they're they're making Eagle toys still is amazing because people just look at these things and it makes them happy. Yeah. Strong visuals, optimism, yeah. Honesty, right. strong sense of good and evil. Right. These are kind of yeah. I mean, I just Anderson recently DNA. yeah. I recently got the uh, uh, the original Dinky again. I had all my Dinkies had um, you know gone by the wayside. Yeah. But somebody I knew had one of the original releases of the Dinky in the original colors that it first came out in, in the packaging, the whole thing. It's mint. Wow. And every time I look at it, it just brings back a time where. It was so wonderful. The show was on for the first time. It was an amazing, you know, movie of the week thing. I ran to FAO Schwartz when Bob Mandel told me the toys were in stock and bought it. And I look at it, I just remember I, any of the toys, the, those wonderful little Konami models that were done of all the yeah. 60 shows. And you just can't help but smile because they just make you think of happier times. And I think yeah. that's why... Jerry's shows always last because they make people feel better, yeah. especially when things uh, in these times when things are harder. Yeah. Bring a ray of uh, happiness and joy. Yeah. 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 David, if, uh, if people want to follow your work, hear about your upcoming books, <laughs> where can they, where can they do that? I'm just on Facebook. That's about it. I'm very, I'm very social media challenged. That's the, the place to find you. Yeah. I'm just not one of the, these people that do, uh, you know, blogs and stuff. Sure. Cause I, uh, you know, I, I work hard. I come home, I, I sleep a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and then of course these, these two projects I'm working on right now, the book and the, I would take up a lot of my time. I only have time right now because everyone's on vacation. Uh, my co-author is traveling. So, um, he's not sending me all little notes anymore about we have to do this. We have to do that. I mean, yeah. cause this book started off as one book. And now we're oh, and it's split. Oh, because we have so much material on this subject. Well, I can't wait to read it. Thanks so much for sharing yeah. your uh, your yeah. valuable time with us. Thank you. We really thank appreciate you. it. Well, thank you to our all American all star team of David and Ben. Yeah, that was nice. David Hirsch, just lovely to hear yet another mm. perspective from the world of Anderson. So mm -hmm. thank you, David. Indeed. And uh, do keep an eye out on Facebook for updates on when and where David's new Space Nineteen Ninety Nine book will be available. Yes. Um, and uh, oh yes hmm. what next week Richard James yeah I um, think I'm going to carry on being a bit lazy to be honest are you having another week off yeah. oh well I'll join you then no oh, no I'll you can't listen to what no hey? no 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 what it's all over to you because it's one of your chums off of that there Twitter I believe oh Stephen Gallagher yes 
That's right, director, producer, writer, uh, screenwriter, Stephen Gallagher, who you might know from, oh, crikey, the worlds of Doctor Who, the likes of Warriors Gate and Terminus, or you might know from The Eleventh Hour, big uh, American uh, TV series with, uh, I think, Rufus Sewell over here and Patrick Stewart in the States, I think. Uh, Bugs, of course, all sorts of stuff. Yeah, well, I worked with him back in the 90s on a thing called October, you see, and so did Charlotte, my wife, strangely. Ah. So, yes, hooked up with uh, Stephen Gallagher, and uh, he gave me a bit of his time to talk to me about TV production and Jerry Anderson in particular. Great. That's next week, is it? Great. That is next week, yes. I'm looking forward nice. to that. So thanks for giving me another rest. I mean, I'm barely doing anything yeah. these days, just sitting around. Well, I had uh, noticed. Mm. Yeah. yeah, drinking your <laughs> pomegranate and lemonade tea or whatever it was. Uh, no, it's dark morello cherry and pomegranate fizzy water. Great. Nice. It's very tasty, very subtle flavour. Anyway, mm-hmm. we're, we're not sponsored mm. by San Pellegrino yet. No, right, I see what's going on here. Now, you're listening to the Jerry Anderson Podcast. Now, I haven't said this for a while. Please subscribe to us on whichever channel you're listening to us on and whichever platform we're on because uh, that means you get to hear every single episode and I'd hate you to miss out. You can also leave us a rating, of course, which is a a lovely review and a rating and we might even read one out. And you can click on the link and share it with your uh, friends via all your social media profiles so they get to hear us too. Mm. Now, over on Twitter, people have been hashtagging us, Jerry Anderson Podcast, and they've been tagging me. Yeah, Richard N. James and you, I'm Jamie Anderson. And really? him over there, oh, he's just wringing out his cloth now. That's good. Chris Dalek, for example. <laughs> Kyle says, thinking about starting a podcast about a particular Jerry Anderson show because I think a study in Captain Scarlet is too good a title to waste. I like that. Nice. Well, I mean, that is that is the ideal reason to start a podcast. It's just you've a, got quite, a good just title. Just you've got a title. Yeah. yeah. Do it. GG Equine said, unexpected crossover of the week. What do grazing muzzles have to do with classic British puppet programmes? Find out on Pod 114 of the Jerry Anderson podcast. Jamie surprised our whole team with this discussion about whether his horses wear muzzles. <laughs> GG Equine. <laughs> There. Yeah, they don't, is the answer there, no. in case to, to save you listening back to that uh, fascinating tidbit. <laughs> oh, you've given it away now. Jeff Owen says, why doesn't Matthew or anyone else's legs are spread when he's shrunk by Reverend Stanley Unwin's minimizer in the Secret Service? Or am I reading too much into things? I'm not quite sure why his legs would spread when he was That's shrunk. sounding a bit why would they sp- rude, isn't spread? it? Oh, I suppose, because when you, when you shrink, your feet would stay... Potentially in the same planted position. In the same position, yeah. So you'd... Yeah. Mm. I, I think you yeah, might I, be reading I, a little tiny bit you, too much into it. Could be right, yeah. Ride Theory says, I couldn't resist. I've just ordered a Thunderbird 2-themed Chuck Taylor base basketball shoes. Ooh. If I made a custom pair in Thunderbird 1 colours, I could wear one on each foot and play along with a lot of episodes. <laughs> yeah, nice. And he posted a picture. Really nice, sort of like um, high top uh, kind of converse, but in Thunderbird yeah. 2 colours. Very nice. And listen, Jamie, here's the good news. Phil Steer. Oh, well, tweeted of the to say, Phil Steer uh, podcast. Yep, uh, there you go. Says, I was really expecting your final, final episode of a series, Jamie. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago. To be the unfortunate demise of Little Joe 90. Can you imagine? <laughs> No, I don't hold him in high enough regard to uh, finish him off. And also, finally, Phil just said, uh, read your question at the end of pod 143, where we uh, discussed each other's foibles. He says, my greatest foible has to be foible XL5. Oh, Phil. (laughs) Oh, Phil. But uh, there we are. (laughs) Thanks for getting in touch, everyone, except Phil. Do remember, you can hashtag us, Jerry Anderson Podcast. I'll see your tweets, and I'll read them out next time. Yes, well... Please do write in. I can't wait for the next Phil Steer email. Bon Mo, yes. Bon Mo, yes. Uh, those yeah. are his middle names. So, <laughs> Richard James. Mm? Yes. I can see Chris Dale loitering awkwardly in front of us. His, his, he, he is, His he? waxy mm. rag is now over his shoulder. He looks primed and ready <laughs> to hit his randomizer button. Great. So uh, I guess we should probably let him do that because he's here for the randomizer. Yeah, go on then. Hmm? Oh, hello everyone. Uh, sorry, I'm not sure what I've got for you today. Actually, you see, I'm off on holiday. Hold on, I'll just uh, ask if you can come along as well. That'll be all right, won't it, Parker? Hey. Manners, manners. Lord Parker, if you don't mind. Oh, I'm sorry, yes, Lord Parker. <laughs> Here's Thunderbirds. Oh, audible load of old rubbish. <laughs> 
so welcome back to Thunderbirds. We're starting with some uh, leftover music from Supercar as we uh, rejoin the second season for Lord Parker's Holiday. I actually noticed while uh, looking at my notes earlier, the second season of Thunderbirds, we seem to be doing this in reverse order. We started with Give or Take a Million, and now uh, after that it was Ricochet, and now we're on Lord Parker's Holiday. So uh, it'd be interesting to see if we keep going backwards through the, uh, the sixth season two episodes. That's... Uh Hmm, an odd thing. Anyway, we're opening with this lovely shot of uh, little village of Monte Bianco. Here's the uh, reflector station, and inside we have TARDIS console. Six-sided thing with a central column. Uh, if not a, a definite nod to to Doctor Who, then uh, an amazing coincidence. And inside, um, two science gentlemen who, I have to admit, I don't remember their names. But I'm... It is Mitchell's the son. Mitchell, there we go. I've ceased to wonder at its enormous energy. With the solar generator, Professor, you have captured a little of that energy. Yes, Professor and Mitchell. Uh, this is only the first stage. Tonight we will generate electricity for one small town. And if this is successful, we will supply the whole valley. And then, who knows, perhaps the whole world. Shall I say nothing can go wrong, or shall I leave that to you, Professor? Yeah, this is the Professor puppet from... Uh, I think this is the Professor Borinder puppet from uh, Perils of Penelope. Looks like he's even wearing the same clothes. Center on the heat exchange. Yes, they've set up a, a solar dish to uh, to collect the energy from the sun to power the town. Centered. Lining it up on the uh, the sun itself. I, I I like that shot of the actual the very end of the I don't know what you'd call it the the solar collector. It kind of looks like a, a sort of um, film camera or film light. Anyway, we're now over to Creighton Ward Manor. Will this be all, Milady? Yes, I think so. Um, there are one or two other knickknacks, but I'll bring those down myself. I just hope I don't forget. Travelling light this time, only four cases. Yes, my lady. Now, I want you to consider the next few days as a holiday for you as much as for me. It's unusual for Penelope. I think in The Impostors we saw a whole mountain of cases that she wanted to take with her. Very good, my lady. Maybe she's learnt from her experiences with, uh, with Jeremiah Tuttle, but I doubt it. And, of course, it would rain before they go off on holiday. Oh, dear, it's raining again. But we must make a start. Where are you, Parker? Right here, my lady. Parker. Oh, he's looking very ready for his holiday. Took me at my word. I hope the inclement weather doesn't spoil your outfit. Oh, I, I understand the sun always shines in Monty Blanco. And it's a nice little uh, town they've created here, despite the fact that really we only see the uh, the hotel set. Visitors, all they bring is more work. Manned by these two lovely characters. Tomorrow our little town will be famous. The first in the world to be lit by electricity from a solar station. This is the uh, long-suffering, I don't know, what 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 do you call what what would you call Bruno? I was going to say butler, but he's not a butler. You don't get butlers in a hotel. It is against nature. But he's got a catchphrase. It's a great disaster. Yay. What do you say? The sun will take its revenge. It will be a great disaster. Idiot! Get back to work! Oh, it's Signor Fancini is the chap he's working for, played by Jeremy Wilkin, and Bruno is played by Charles Tingwell. Oh, wrong. His uh, first appearance in the Thunderbirds TV series, I believe, he's also playing Mitchell. You wouldn't necessarily know that that's him playing, uh, playing Bruno at first. But Bruno's a lovely character, as we'll come to discover through this episode. What's the temperature? Yes, sir. Keep it below 1,000 degrees absolute. And as TARDIS consoles go, this one that they've got at the solar station is actually pretty darn well designed. Um, I'm not sure you could get away with the rest of the room as, as a TARDIS interior, but uh, generators do not this is a very nice control console set. Visitors tonight. It's almost a shame, really, that uh, it's, it's, it's not going to be produced in that... Um, isn't there a part work at the moment? A TARDIS consoles part work. Be nice to see it made in there. Anyway, very good. We're not going to have that. We have Penelope and Parker heading off on holiday. What stock Barry Gray music is it? Ah, there we go. Mm, there's a great deal of interference. Blue Pacifica. Mm. The interference seems to be general. It's probably the mountains. We're very near them now. And I can still remember actually the the first time I saw this episode, as I often I, I seem to remember I seem to be able to remember. Uh, first sights of episodes. I remember going around a friend's house, actually, uh, 
This is a friend I think I've mentioned on here before who used to find the uh, the explosion of the terrorfish in Stingray really funny, you know, when their mouths are flapping open and closed once they've been hit. He had a VHS tape of this and uh, Give or Take a Million. I believe it was uh, volume 16 on the old VHS collection from uh, Channel 5 or, or Polygram it might even have been then. And I just remember because Thunderbirds was on TV at the time uh, airing on the BBC, the sheer... It, 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 it almost blew my mind, the idea that you can watch episodes out of order. You don't have to wait for the BBC to show them. You could go out and buy them now. But I sure it's wish probably I... one of my first first inklings that, um, that that was a thing you could do. Problem of storing electricity on a commercial scale. Right. The cyclonic battery is a real step forward. Jeff and Brains are having a hearty uh, cup of tea. Then use this to generate power. Uh, the idea's old enough. Catching us up on the... Uh, technical background of the solar reflector. Wish I was there to see it. Brains is very nearly tipping his uh, tea out of his cup. But will he get his wish to come and see the solar reflector? You know, this is Thunderbirds, and this is a highly experimental piece of technology. I'm sure he'll get to experience it up close before too long. The output voltage high enough? Yes, sir. We can maintain 150,000 kilowatts for about 20 hours. Good. Are the cyclonic regulators checked? Yes, Professor. We're ready to switch on as soon as it's dark. What about the Helmic regulator? And those Zyton crystals? I'm sorry, I love the TARDIS. I love the TARDIS console. Ah, I won't mention any more about it. Unless I do. Oh, stormy weather as Fab One arrives at the hotel in Monte Bianco. Oh, Signorina Penelope, I feel ashamed to welcome you to this. And again, as I mentioned uh, last week with the lighthouse dwellers, Puppets being rained on. The English are always prepared for rain. Oh dear. <laughs> oh, the state of them both. Parker just standing there like a complete, well, a complete drip, really. Get their bags inside. Oh. Tonight we celebrate. Yeah, Bruno is uh, Signor Fancini's Parker equivalent. So Parker doesn't mind bossing him around because uh, he's on holiday, as Penny said. You'd better change, senor, before you flood the hotel. Oh, I say, very fancy. You look very fine, senor, but where is Signorina Penelope? Ah, here she is. Yes, this hotel apparently has all sorts of uh, costumes on hand. Penelope's done herself up as... Is this me meant to be Marie Antoinette? Uh, or somebody of that era? The puppet's giving a giving it a go of walking down the stairs, but the dress is possibly slightly too big to to make it look as convincing as it might. But she does look very I nice. Say, Parker, you look quite dashing. <laughs> Thank you, belady. That costume of yours is a bit of a knockout. Why? Thank you, Parker. I'll take that as a most gracious compliment. Signore, may I have your attention? I am proud to welcome you to Monte Bianco for this great event. Tonight, our town will become the first to be lit by power generated direct from the sun. I find it... This is another crowd scene, lots of people in this hotel, and uh, again, it's it's one where you can see they have a limited number of puppeteers. Some puppets just aren't moving. But we're counting down the seconds to the, um, the switch over to the energy from the solar generator that's going to power the town tonight. Despite this very bad storm, I'm sure the storm will pass very soon, though. Five... Four, three, two, one, activate. And that's it. The whole town has got power. Bravo! Magnifico! Salute. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, uh, good health, Belide. And this is obviously in this period of the show where Penelope and Parker have... Uh, do have increasingly a lot of screen time to themselves at the expense of other members of International Rescue. I think I've said before that I'm not mad keen on that. It's really building up. Uh, partly because I'm not a mad fan of the whole Penelope spy thing, but since that part of it isn't much of an element with this episode, uh, I find myself enjoying this one quite a bit. Storms, they can get pretty violent. Oh, yeah. I think also because, as I said, it's that sheer novelty of I saw this before it was shown on TV, at least in the 90s. So it's kind of like, aha, this was one I saw before many other people. 
Anyway, oh, Parker's having fun with his spag bowl. Uh, wind it around the fork, Parker. That is what it is, isn't it? I would have thought he'd be he'd be. You'll soon master it. He'd be familiar with it, or, or was that not a not a huge thing in England of the sixties? I must admit, I'm not. Uh, I'm an expert on many things, but I'm not an expert on uh, on noodly foods. Musica. <gasps> Yay! Oh, over in the corner, the Cass Carnaby Five playing the musica. Although it's um, obviously it's just stock footage. They're not really there, but it's nice to think that they are. It will be a great disaster. And of course, they don't recognise Penelope and Parker. Uh oh, the tower's been hit. It's hopes the conductor can take it. Well, lightning rarely strikes twice. I think they'll be okay. Oh, what do you know? Lightning struck twice. Check the primary circuits. It's not going to strike for a third time, surely. I'm also not clear if this. Uh, the reflector is attracting the lightning like a magnet. This uh, solar station is directly beneath beneath the reflector tower. I suppose it must be because the professor gets up there very quickly. But you wouldn't want this thing collapsing on top of you. Oh! I think the tower is starting to crack. Not that such a thing is going to happen, of course. Oh, that's it. Professor's going out to take a look. Cut the power. But Professor, I said cut the power. No, oh, that's it. What's wrong? Oh, town's gone out. Signore, signore, please, be calm. We will light the candles. So they've lit the candles. Something must be wrong. Is it serious, belady? I don't know, Parker. Fourth lightning strike on the tower. Or is that third? I've not been I've not been keeping count. Can't take much more of this. The tower will collapse. Hmm. This is one of those I don't think they really thought this through Thunderbird's inventions. Which is a shame because it's a really nice idea. It's a really nice uh, especially for this show, which is so often, you know, stuffing a nuclear reactors into anything. Fuel fifth lightning strike there. Fuel guzzling monstrosities like the crab logger and such. This is a nice eco-friendly sixth lightning strike. My goodness. How unlucky is this thing? Great disaster. Yeah, and the rest. Yeah, nice eco-friendly bit of Thunderbirds tech. Too bad it uh we what 20 uh, 20 minutes in and that's it. It's down. Just missing the station, and I love the sound effects on this thing crashing down the mountainside. Rolling all the way down the cliff and wedging itself at the bottom. Oh. Here's an odd moment, though. The reflector's been smashed. How is Penelope the only one in the hotel to notice that? Why was she? Why did she happen to be looking in its direction at the uh, in the first place anyway? Oh well, it was a good try. It was a good idea. Luckily, the professor's escaped with a. Uh, happened to the defector. It's oh, a rather nasty cut on his uh, forehead there. I will help you inside, sir. Again, these poor puppets getting absolutely soaked. This storm, she is passing. Ah, oh, and here comes the moon. Oh, and of course the reflector has landed. Wouldn't you know it, it's landed at just the right angle to reflect the moonlight down onto the town. Again, this is, a, as well as being a nice idea, it's a lovely, rather ingenious setup for a Thunderbirds episode. A giant mirror. It's reflecting the moonlight down onto the town. First, first the whole environmentally friendly aspect of it, and then secondly, okay, there's been this accident, but actually this... Tonight she's very warm, the party will begin again. This, we can have this moonlight party. That's fine. And uh, nobody accepts, except uh, Penelope is thinking, well, maybe uh, once the moon goes down and the sun comes up, we could be in a bit of trouble by it. Psst, signorina. Il sole vengo domani sarò una disastre. I want to do it to get you. What are you doing here, Bruno? Get back to work. Again, all the puppets in the background are absolutely rock stiff. Soft in the air. There's a guy behind Penelope I think might be dead. His eyes aren't even moving. But what did he say, belady? But then you're not supposed to be looking at the background characters, even though I, and I, I'm sure many of us do, 
I like keeping an eye on the background characters and seeing what they're doing. Contact Jeff. Find the old man and make sure he talks to no one. And make sure no one leaves. We may need every pair of hands we can get. International rescue. Come in, please. Only Penelope could go on holiday and require the services of international rescue. But again, it's it's building up to a moment where... Uh, Storm in the mountain. Once again, we get to see her driving Fab 1, which always gives us flashbacks to... Uh, the driving scene in Vault of Death and the assumption that either she had lessons since then or that whole thing was a massive deception on her part to scare the living daylights out of Parker. This is also, I believe, the, the first time we see uh, Fab One go on water in the television series. We see it in water in, in the first film, Thunderbirds Are Go, and this jetty she's driving off of here, very slowly, is the same one she drives off in the film or fab one drives off in the film i should say it's even got that number three right next to it uh where we saw various uh, stingray publicity photos taken over the years as well i believe and this is a lovely image of fab one just cruising over the surface of the water and of course they happen past a yacht and of course there's the drunk i've heard of pink elephants but a pink rolls royce out of the sea Driven by Barney Antoinette is ridiculous. I also recognise the yacht. I wonder if it might be Fab 2. Is that who Parker lost it to? That guy? This should be far enough. Seeing Fab 1 on the surface of the water like this, I often wonder if uh, if it had underwater capabilities, if it might have been uh, like a forerunner of the Lotus Esprit. That would have been quite fun. Because um, obviously we know from Stingray the, uh, the AP Films model crew could do that sort of thing in their sleep. Go on, Penny. But I'm playing chess with brains. The reflector from the solar station crashed on the mountain during a storm. Gee, that thing must weigh 400 tons. The reflector jammed about halfway down the mountainside, but at such an angle that tomorrow the sun will be concentrated down onto the town. I get the picture. It'll be like holding a giant burning glass over the town. As the sun moves, it'll sweep across Monte Bianco, burning everything in its path. Exactly. And hurry, you'll be racing against the sun. Right, Penny, we're on our way. Thunderbird 1 will be underway in 30 seconds. Boys? Thunderbird 2 will be right behind him. International rescue from Thunderbird 1. Changing to horizontal flight. So, Thunderbird 1 is on the way, and is this the episode where we go to an advert break after Thunderbird 1 launches, and we come back and Thunderbird 2 is still launching? Let's find out. My goodness it is. Oh, it worries me that I can remember details like that. It really worries me. It's also odd that they would split this over the uh, over the advert break like that. Normally it's like, right, we're off, we're on our way, ba 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 ba, and then we go to the advert break. This is kind of um, I don't want to say anticlimactic because everybody obviously likes to see Thunderbird two launching, but it's like you know, we we did the launching scene. That's done. You look kind of worried, Jeff. What's wrong? I don't know, Mother. I just got a feeling about this assignment. Yeah, and here's an odd ang angle to this story. Jeff's got a feeling. He's he's just got a feeling. He can't can't put it into words. He just oh, he's got a feeling. Um, I suppose it's there to make this feel a bit um, a bit different, a bit ominous, uh, to add some weight to something that happens later on. But uh, it it really need not be there. It doesn't really add all that much. Uh, come on, Thunderbird two, get going. Thank you. Yep, this is Virgil, Allen, and Brains. Very slowly off after Scott. International Rescue are on their way, Parker. I, I don't quite follow, Belady. Who is in danger? By this hotel. The whole town. Oh, poor old Parker. They burnt to a cinder, unless we can move the reflector before the sun comes out tomorrow. Oh, of course. The sun. Now I had to stay. I'm yeah, someone's had a lot to drink tonight. Very good, belady. Now I'm relying on you, Parker, to keep the guests in the hotel. It's strange that nobody else considers that in the hotel. And this is fun as well, leaving Parker to sort uh, sort everybody out in the hotel. Now, now look here. Tomorrow morning, we could be in trouble. 
Savvy? It will be a great disaster. Yeah, all right, all right. If the guests thought they were in danger, they would panic to leave. Exactly. That's why it's a borough boarded. We must keep them occupied. I love this as well with Parker being left in charge. Mind off things. Get them to play a little game. Because although he's an international rescue agent, he's very often just the chauffeur. It's nice to see him take charge like this. Sam, all right, my dear. He was very lucky. I'm sorry we meet again under such tragic circumstances. We won't go into the backstory of our previous meeting, though. All three. I've done some calculations. It's also nice to throw Parker together with a similar character who's of a completely different nationality to the point where they almost don't understand each other. They just barely have communication. Uh, they're, they're a very nice... Very nice duo, Parker and Bruno. And of course, Bruno did return many years later. I believe there's a a fan film with Parker, um, voiced by David Graham, and he gets a call from Bruno, voiced by Charles Tingwell. I've only seen bits of that. Uh, I'm sure it's out there somewhere. As the sun sets here, on the other side of the world, it'll rise on sleeping Monte Bianco. And of course, the streets of Monte Bianco are deserted. That must have been a really good party last night. Thunderbird 1 to Thunderbird 2. ETA, Monte Bianco, 5.49 local time. FAB, Scott. We're about 20 minutes behind you. Have you been able to contact the solar station? I'd sure like to get an idea of a problem. Well, I can use the radio camera. I'll send you a few shots as soon as I can. FAB. The, uh, Thunderbird 1 was approaching Monte Bianco there. We saw a side-on shot of it. Thunderbird 1 is flying in blue daylight, and then we cut to Thunderbird 2, and they're flying along stormy clouds. They must be a very long way behind them. The IF stage is gone, the oscillators are burnt out. The lightning's ruined the radio. Isn't there anything we can do other than... The lightning's ruined everything except that wonderful TARDIS console. Well, there's no point in me staying here. Now, Mitchell, we'd better get the professor to hospital. He needs treatment. I called International Rescue before I left the hotel. They'll take care of everything. And that is it for the professor and Mitchell now, I think. Meanwhile, Parker and Bruno have set up... Well, they've set up a bingo hall. Downstairs, everyone is presumably sleeping off the night before. Where did they find the time to make all the, the score sheets and the, the massive Lord Parker's bingo sign? I love it. Oh. He's so, he's so creative when left to his own devices. I mean, professionally printed score sheets. Come on. Well, Bruno, that seems adequate. Go wake them. Wake them up, senor? They didn't get to bed till three. We've got to get... Oh, three. Sorry, this talk of going to bed is making me sleepy. <laughs> I'm not sure what that's about. I'm naturally quite sleepy if you've never met me. Start with the manager. I'll need him to assist me. Oh, si, senor. Oh, poor old Bruno has to go wake everybody up. Oh, uh, but the clock in the manager's room says it's five to six now. It is time to get up. Uh, what is... What, what does he want? Lord Parker wants you downstairs. Oh. oh it is six o'clock, Bruno. Go away, you stupid. Oh. That clock is advancing in real time as well, which is quite sweet. Ah, the miracles of technology. They're getting paper printout of the photos. Instantaneously beamed to Thunderbird 2. It sure looks a tricky setup. Any ideas, Brains? Well, we may be able to tilt the reflector up so that it faces skywards. You said it weighs 400 tons, Brains. I know. It won't be easy, but it's our only chance. Whatever happened to the old um, remote control camera Thunderbird 1 had? That would seem to be useful in times like this. They don't use that after... Well, they only use it a couple of times, actually, don't they? Anyway, Parker's keeping uh, everything organised at the hotel. Your Lordship, please excuse me. I did not realise. And I love how how instantly fawning the manager is here. Back here, as it It's another lovely Jeremy Wilkin character. Ready to join us in our little game. Uh, si, senor. When they heard you were the English Lord, they were most willing. Yeah, I thought they'd fall... Uh, let it join in. Oh. 
And it's lovely as well that Parker and Bruno, uh, Parker and Bruno, are only just managing to pull this off. Based on Thunderbird two, just about like, literally, if anybody thinks about it, it's all going to fall apart. But everyone's too awed of Lord Parker to do anything about it. Be careful. I've got a feeling about this one. I will, Father. There it is. Ah, thanks, Alan. There's the sun. We'll have to work fast. Hmm. Assuming I propose we blow up the sun, Virgil. Now, Brains, we've talked about this. B but I've got my sun-destroying machine already. You'll have to lower me down to get a real close look. It's not your job, Brains. I'll go. I, I need to see it at close quarters. I'll radio a full description. I it's not the same. Stop arguing, you two. Every minute counts. All right, Brains, it's your assignment. But don't take any chances. Keith, thanks, Virgil. And of course, this scenario of a solar reflector stuck on the side of a mountain, I think they use this in the the first or, or second episode of the Thunderbirds Are Go CGI series from 2015. Uh, I say first or second because it was a, it was a two-parter that opened that series, wasn't it? I, I saw that first two-parter and uh, it didn't inspire me to go back to any, any more. But I was surprised that they just pulled... A whole story idea from the original series and then they were like done with it within about five minutes possibly less possibly this isn't a scenario that requires a full 50 minutes to to resolve but i think the fact that you have the, the stuff going on in the hotel with lord parker um really helps it whereas i remember the cgi equivalent being a bit sort of here's another bunch of cgi people running around going ah um, but maybe the show got better. I, I, as I said, I never saw any more after that. Darn this harness! I, I can't move. Ah, uh, brains is uncomfortable. Are you okay, brains? Yeah, I'm fine. I just took off the harness. It was so clumsy. I said, don't take chances, brains. Don't worry. I know what I'm doing. Yeah, brains is a reckless disregard for danger this week isn't entirely consistent with his character and it's a long way down hurry up brains time's running out okay i'm going to climb up to the rim be careful brains i do like as well several moments where brains is um almost looks like he's going to fall to his death and then it's we cut back to the goings on in the hotel here he is climbing up the side of the uh, reflector this just sheer metal surface and then he slips. Oh, John, oh, John. Honest Lord Parker doesn't pay out until he's checked your card. How's Parker paying for these bingo wins, by the way? Is, is he, uh, did he crack open the safe or has he, has he got Penelope's credit card? Crap. I'm sure it's got to be the former. I doubt she would let him have any access to her money. No matter how much she trusts him. Anyway. Oh, there, Brains. You don't have to tell me twice. I'm getting mighty high. Inside this suit. Brains has got Thunderbird 2's electromagnet thingy clamped onto the uh, solar reflector, and he's still complaining about this suit. And I like it's the same kind kind of um, protective fire suit that we've seen uh, seen several times before. I think um, usually when when people are, are driving the Firefly. Well, I say people. That's normally Virgil, isn't it? I also wonder with this. Um, okay, Alan. Brains is clear. If moving the thing is um, the only option available, I get that it's probably the most practical, but um, could they not, I don't know, could they not destroy the the generator part of it? What if they just shot it? It's not moving. And Thunderbird 2 has missiles. Um, or they could just throw a great big sheet over it. This, this, is, this is one of the options that... Uh, Actually, I think this is probably why I'm not a member of International Rescue. I I come up with silly ideas. It's still not shifting, Virgil. I'm going all the way. Full thrust. Full boost vertical. Come on, Thunderbird 2. I located the trouble. The gear's jammed. It'll take me a couple of minutes to cut through. I don't think we've got a couple of minutes, Brains. The hotel's starting to smoke. <laughs> Maybe, yeah, maybe just a big blanket throw over the thing. Smoke? Why didn't I think of that before? Is Scott still around, Virgil? Why, yes, he is. 
I love that. <laughs> yeah, Scott's just, just Scott's just gone radio silent since he arrived. Everyone had almost forgotten he was there. Bingo! Well done, lady. Now we're going like an house on fire. What am I saying? Uh, so Thunderbird 1 is pumping out black smoke to uh, blot out the sun. It's not really working. The hotel is still smouldering, but it's given time. It's given brains time to... Uh, what was it he said was stuck? I don't know, but he's he's cutting through it now. It's not the most thrilling of, of climaxes to a Thunderbirds episode, as much as I'm enjoying this. Um, I think because probably nobody is actually directly in danger. I mean, we know the town will go up in flames if International Rescue don't do this. But because we don't have, like, a person sort of going, Ah, help! Oh, we've got to get to them in time. Oh, no. It's like, you know, welding and, and cutting and uh, trying to shift the thing. God. Again, we're very light on dramatic music, in that we don't have any. Okay, boys, take her up. So Brains is complaining about the suit, but uh, well, it looks like he's clear. Thunderbird 2 is going to start lifting again. Oh, now we have music. Okay, I suppose it's justified here. <laughs> even if this is a very slow-moving procedure. I think it's beginning to move. And Brains doesn't want to get too far away, even though this is a thing that weighs so many thousands of tons. He's st still standing right next to it. Oh, that's it. They've got the reflector onto its back, which is something. Now that should do it. Uh-oh. There goes Brains. Brains! Virgil, he's fallen! And although we know, we know Brains hasn't really fallen, it is one of those moments where you think, as a kid, oh no, maybe he might have done, and the fact that you see the rocks so heavily pounding on that suit, and then, yep, the reflector's fallen, coming all the way down the mountain, and if Brains wasn't dead before, he is now. It's such a... Oh, then you get that last shot of the, the hand of the suit sticking out of the rubble. It's been an accident. Brains has fallen. Can you assist? Sure, Virgil. I'll go down and see what I can do. And although it is a nice moment of uh, temporary drama and suspense, you really believe that Brains is dead. He's going to sit here? Or steady out. At least the characters do. Doing everything possible. I saw him fall. He must have been killed. It does make Brains look a bit of a jerk for not radioing in instantly. Don't worry, boys. I I I'm fine. It was only the suit. I took it off. It was so awkward. Uh, Relief. We thought... Now listen, Brains, you... So all that grumbling about the suit actually had a point. Yes, sir. Um, maybe that's point in inverted commas. Much like Jeff's I had a feeling about this one uh, thing. Well, I don't mind telling you I'm glad this one's over. I had a feeling something might go wrong. Uh, don't worry, Mr. Tracy. Oh, we handled the situation. Yes, Father. We'll be home for breakfast. Breakfast? It's 2 a.m. here. I'm going to bed. Oh, Jeff's wearing another snazzy dressing gown. Auntie Bianco, sometimes even I get confused. <laughs> <laughs> well, Lord Parker, I think you owe me an explanation. Well, I, I thought the guest would be more inclined to take orders from an English lord, as it were. I anticipated you would not mind. All right, Parker. In the circumstances, we'll forget it. But tell me, what game so engrossed them that they didn't notice the danger? A game very popular in my youth, as I remember. Bingo. Bingo? <laughs> You'll have to instruct me sometime. This is lovely. I, also, I just wish we could have had that moment that you know must have happened but we don't see it where penelope walks in and sees parker at the you know head of the room leading the uh, the bingo game i anticipated you again my lady but this is a nice ending if a bit strange bingo yep he's already changed to go swimming but he was uh covering himself from penelope for some reason and that was lord parker's holiday which i've always had a lot of time for as i said uh I'm not a huge Penelope fan, so it's nice that um, we get an episode where although she and Parker are the focus, the whole spy thing isn't uh, isn't played up too much. And it's also really nice to see Parker 
Parker take charge for a bit, thrown together with uh, with an equally um, put upon character. Poor old Bruno, lovely character from uh, from Charles Tingwell there. Teleplay by Tony Barwick. Yes, yeah, is T Tony Barwick is one who can, um, as well as being very silly in in later shows, he's one that could think out of the box quite well. So the whole solar reflector thing, the the environmentally you know, friendly for once Thunderbirds device. Looking at the end credit series, the the fire flash is definitely not an environmentally friendly thing. That's that was a really nice angle. Um I you know, the final resolution is not the most exciting, but it's um it's certainly a really nice setup for for a bit of Thunderbirds action. So although this isn't one of my favourites, it's certainly a very strong episode, uh, with some lovely little character moments for poor old Parker. Um, what more can you say but bingo? Ah, oh, we've missed a bit of Thunderbirds, I think. Yeah, it's we? been a while, isn't it? Isn't that odd? Yeah, and uh, nice for to, to, well, anything with Parker in there is uh, oh, is good, especially if he's in yes. the title. I so, know. Um, yes, it lovely. always reminds me, Jamie, of our, uh, our lunch at the King's Arms in Cookham with David Graham. Yes, it was a lifetime ago, doesn't it? But how lovely was that? It oh. does seem like life was very different then, wasn't it? When we could actually yeah, go to pubs and stuff. Um, yeah. God, yeah, because it, it was themed, wasn't it? Yeah, if you yeah. if you missed out on that, uh, Podstorons, you can go back and listen to our um, David Graham special. Eating. When was that? Yeah. Around Pod 60 or 65, maybe? Yeah, probably. Yeah. Yeah, just just pop back and have a look. Oh, Eric, my dog, is coming to say hello. Hello, oh. Eric. Hi, Eric. Oh, without um, the muzzle, I see. Now, yeah, oh, he's got terrible breath, Richard. Right. Oh, dear. Right. <clears throat> Goodness me. Right, well, we I'd better wrap nothing. things up so we can yes. um, let them out. So, <laughs> Eric, please. Oh, really, the breath mints, please. It really smells. Oh. Um, mm, oh, it's quite fishy. He hasn't had any fish, though. Right, anyway, yes, okay. So that was the randomizer. Chris will be back yeah. next week with another randomizer, yeah. with a different random episode of a Jerry Anderson show. Yeah, which is because exciting. it's random. It is, yeah. and he's, he's over... Did we decide 25% of the way through episodes, I think? Oh, Something yeah, like yeah, that. yeah. And then some, yeah. Quite Definitely. impressive. So there you go. And that's kind of the end of the Jerry Anderson podcast today, isn't it? Oh, okay, yeah. And that's, that's it, there's then. anything else you had to say? No, not really. I'll save it for next time. Okay, do that. Um, I'm going to push the dog away. Please do send yeah. us your thoughts and any ideas for treating doggy halitosis to podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk or hashtag yeah. um, Eric's Bad Breath on Twitter. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I look forward to reading those. <laughs> be interesting to see if we get any tweets at all, <laughs> especially about that. Yeah. Thank you for joining us, Podstrons. Yeah. We will be back in your ears next week for Pod 146 of the Jerry Wowzers. Anderson Podcast. Yeah, see you then. Ta-ra! Bye! Stage one complete. Let's go! Okay, I'm I'm just gonna let the dog out because the smell is so bad. So just hang on there, hang on. Eric, come on. God, that's terrible. Really need a wee or something. Kind of breath mint. Right, uh, just coming what back What are now, you so... feeding him? It, it must be the food. God. What are you feeding him? Terrible. Well, dog food. Really? But, goodness me. Yeah. What? 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 Fish? No, just. You know, hard food and Chicken. and and, and uh, doggy meat uh, stuff out of a can, mm. but okay. cool. I mean, I even bought him a toothbrush, a little doggy toothbrush, and some meat flavored toothpaste. Oh, great! So do tell uh, when he brushes his teeth. Do you substitute his real paw for like a, a prop paw with a toothbrush in it <laughs> and move it up and down? You know, like they do in those programs where you see suddenly a dog's paw opening a, a handle, a door handle, or something. Yeah, and it plainly isn't the dog's I, I know, paw. I know what you mean. No, I actually that sort of I thing. actually put on my uh, Romec hands uh, to brush oh. Eric's teeth. Is that a bit weird? Ew. 
Yeah, it's a bit weird, yeah. Oh, okay. well, so please tell me that. that. Okay. Yeah, I would. <coughs> uh, yeah, okay, on that note, um, he's gone outside. It's now getting a bit cold now with the door open, so I'm going to shut the door. You have a All great right. uh, day, week, evening, whatever you're up yeah, to. Yeah, I'll try. And uh, remember to brush your teeth, but not with meat flavor. I will do. I'll go and do it now. Okay. Bye. Bye. You have been listening to the Jerry Anderson Podcast. Wasn't it fun? You have been listening to an Anderson Entertainment production.